another algorithm that I'd like to discuss with you is Simon's algorithm. That was one of the two algorithms on your latest problem set. And I would like to recall the mathematical problem that this algorithm addresses. It's once again, like the, for the Deutsch Joshua algorithm, a rather artificial problem. It's not a problem that's particularly useful for practical applications. But um, as I said, these algorithms, they have been the stepping stones towards algorithms that actually do solve useful problems. So here we consider once again a function um, on bit strings of length n, but this time this function does not map to just 0 or 1, but the function maps to another bit string of the same length. And once again, as in the case of the Deutsch Joshua algorithm, we have some advance information about properties of this function. In this case, we know that there exists a bit string s of length n such that um, f of x and x and f of y are equal if and only if y is either x or x plus s where the plus is once again bitwise and mod 2. And the task is to find that bit string s. This implies, this property implies that the function f is either 2 to 1 or 1 to 1. Um, in the special case where this bit string s is equal to zero, so it consists only of zeros, and this, this may happen, this is allowed. In that case, um, the condition here reads f of x equals f of y if and only if y is x, essentially. And this means that the function is one to one. If, on the other hand, it, s is not equal to zero, then there are, all, there are exactly two arguments, x and x plus s, which yield the same value of the function. And then the function is two to one. Yeah, so we have one of these two cases. Let's think for a moment um, how many function calls we would need classically in order to find the S. Classically, what would we have to do? Classically, we would have to keep calling the function for different arguments x until one of two things happen. Either we find two different um, arguments x1 and x2 which give the same value of the function. Then we know from the prior information that x2 must be x1 plus s. And given x1 and x2, <clears throat> we can calculate s. So suppose you found um, x1, two different arguments, x1 and x2. They are not equal and they give the same value of the function. Then from the prior information that was given to us, we know we must have x, x2 is x1 plus s. But this immediately implies 
that um, x1 plus x2, so the bitwise, bitwise addition of these two arguments, x1 plus x2, that's x1 plus x1 plus s. We, we discussed uh, in a previous uh, occasion that the sum of two identical terms always gives zero. x1 plus x1 bitwise addition mod 2 gives zero. So this is actually s. So once we have x1 and x2, we can simply find s by adding the two, mod 2. And we are done. So classically, we can try out different arguments uh, for the function until we find two arguments which give the same value of the function. And then we can add these two arguments uh, bitwise mod 2 and we find s and we are done. Or else, if we don't find such um, two different arguments, um, then we have to keep trying until we've, we've tried half the possible arguments plus one more. And if none of them, no two of them gave the same value of the function, then we know the function must be one to one and this means that s must be zero. Yeah, so in the worst case, we have to try once again, two to the power n half plus one arguments. We have to evaluate the function so many times until we can be sure about the value of s. So just like in the case of deutsch -Georgia, um the um, num number of function calls grows exponentially with the length of the bit string. You can um, maybe think for yourself. Uh, that's that's quite a nice uh, exercise. If you if you say that all the s's are all the possible s's are uh, equally likely then you can calculate at least approximately the the average number or the expected number of function calls to find the s and um, you will find that um, the expected number of function calls uh, actually grows a little bit more slowly than 2 to the power n over 2 plus 1 but still exponentially, just with a with a smaller base. The base is not two, but it turns out the base is square root of two. Now, um, we want to tackle this problem with a quantum circuit. And I claim that we can do better than an exponentially growing number of function calls. Simon's algorithm once again uses an oracle. It looks very much like the oracle used in the Deutsch Joshua algorithm, except for some small differences. So once again, we have n data qubits um, whose state remains unchanged if um, they are in a basis state. But now, in contrast to the deutsch joscha algorithm, we allow, or we, we also have n target qubits. So not just a single target qubit, but n target qubits. So we have uh, the slash n also on the lower wire. And the state y of the target qubits is also an n qubit state. And um, the action of the oracle is, however, um, completely analogous to the Deutsch-Joscha case. Um, we 
if x and y are basis states, then the oracle adds to the y uh, the value of the function evaluated for x. And now both um, y and f of x are bit strings of length n. And we do this addition bitwise, mod 2. Yeah. So this is the slightly modified oracle that we use in Simon's algorithm. And here's the circuit. The circuit two also bears a lot of uh, similarities with the Deutsch Joscha algorithm with a few twists. And I would like to mark the differences. First of all, the target qubits. Um, in the Deutsch Joshua case, we had a, just a single target uh, qubit and it started in the basis state one. Here we have n target qubits and they all start in the basis state zero. Then before entering the, the oracle, we have Hadamar's only on the data qubits, but not on the target qubits. And the third difference is that immediately after the oracle, we perform a measurement on the target qubits. And then we keep going with the data qubits. We do the Hadamar on the data qubits, as in the Deutsch Doscha case, and then a measurement on the data qubits as in the Deutsch Joshua case. Yeah? But these, what I marked in red, these are the three differences with the Deutsch Joshua algorithm. And once again, I would like to go through the various stages um, of the calculation with you. The Psi 1. That's completely analogous to the Deutsch Joshua case. Um, and I use once again this uh, the, the same formula for the effect of the Hadamar transformation on the basis state is zero. The Psi one gives one over two to the power n half. Then we have a sum over all bit strings of length n. So x is in 0, 1, n, x. So this is the, what I wrote here, this is the effect, or that's the state of the data qubits after the um, Hadamard transformations. The target qubits are unchanged in the basis state where uh, all, all qubits, all target qubits are in the basis state zero. Then comes the oracle. And what does the oracle do? The first part remains unchanged. The, we consider each term in the sum separately. Each term in the sum is uh, such that the data qubits are in a basis state. So when a basis state goes into the oracle, um, then this basis state is unchanged. So this is still x. What is the effect of the oracle on the target uh, state? It adds to this basis state of the target qubits. It adds the value of the function evaluated for x. Now the uh, initial state of the target qubits is zero. So if I add to zero, the value of the function evaluated for x, then I just get the value of the function, so f of x. This is the state psi 2 after the oracle. At this point, 
I perform a measurement on the target qubits only. This measurement here. And I find some value of the function. It's a big superposition state here, and each contribution to that uh, to this superposition is, um, as far as the target qubits are concerned, is in a, a basis state f of x. Yeah, and when I perform a measurement on the target qubits, I will measure one of these f of x's. Yeah. Since we know that um, x and x plus s give the same value of the function, yeah? so we remember that these two arguments, x plus s and x, give the same value of the function, and they are the only two arguments to give that value of the function. We know that when we measure a certain value of the function, we know that the argument can be either x or x plus s. And after the measurement, we must project onto the eigenspace associated with the value that we measured. So the Psi 3 after the measurement must be the Psi 2 projected orthogonally onto the eigenspace associated with the value of the function that we measured here. Yeah. And in this sum here, there can be two contributions, either x, but also x plus s. So after the measurement, we still have a superposition, and this superposition contains two states, name, states namely, namely x and x plus s. That's a crucial step here. We have here a big sum, a big superposition containing lots of tensor product states. Then we measure a particular value of the function. So a particular f of x. And after we've measured that, we must project onto the eigenspace associated with that particular measured value of the function. Now, there can be two x's, two arguments, that yield the same value of the function, the same f, f of x. It could be x, or it could be x plus s. So, in this big superposition, we have two terms in the sum, one term involving x, and one term involving x plus s, and they both give the same value of the function. So, if after the measurement we project onto the eigenspace associated with that value here, then the projected state still contrib uh, contains contributions from x and from x plus s. So, after the projection, we have a superposition that uh, contains x and x plus s. So the n target qubits are in the eigenstate associated with the measured value of the function. But for the data qubits, we have two contributions in a superposition, namely basis state x and basis state x plus s. Now, from now on, um, nothing happens with the target qubits. They have done their share and we don't need them anymore. So actually, from now on, I would like to omit 
the state of the target qubits because everything else that's interesting is going to happen with the data qubits. In the next step, we apply to the data qubits another Hadamard transformation. And we obtain state psi 4. And for the action of the Hadamard gate, I would like to use once again the same representation uh, that I used also for Deutsch Joshua, namely that uh, the n fold tensor product of the Hadamars applied to a basis state x has the effect 1 over 2 to the power n half, sum, sum over z. So the z's are bit strings again of length n minus 1 to the power x scalar product with z basis state z. That's a formula that I had used before for the Deutsch Joshua, and I'm going to use it again here. And we use it both for the first contribution in the superposition and the second one. If I may omit the pre-factors, I write a proportionality sign that makes it somewhat easier. Uh, so we get here a sum over bit strings z and then from application to the first basis state x we get a factor minus 1 to the power x scalar product with z and from application to the second basis state here we get a minus 1 to the power x plus s scalar product z. And then basis state z. Now we can, uh, we can multiply out this bracket. We see that we have a common uh, factor here, minus 1 to the power x scalar product with z. We can take that in front of the bracket and absorb that into the proportionality. What's interesting is what remains. We have 1 plus and then minus 1 to the power <clears throat> s scalar product with z. This is the state psi 4 on which we perform the final measurement. Now, this final measurement can yield any z that contributes to this sum. So, any z where the associated amplitude, uh, which is proportional to the square bracket, is non-zero. Well, this square bracket is non-zero if and only if the um, this second term here in the sum, if that is plus one. So in other words, if the scalar product of s with z is even or it's zero mod two. So if and only if the scalar product of s of these two bit strings s and z is 0 mod 2. Yeah, only those z which satisfy this condition, which have a vanishing scalar product with s. Only, only those z have a non-zero amplitude and therefore can be the outcome of this measurement here. So, in the circuit at the end, what we found is that this final measurement on the data qubits will produce some z, some bit string z, 
which has the property that its scalar product with the unknown s that we are looking for vanishes mod 2 okay so you see obviously that this circuit hasn't produced the bit string s that we are looking for instead it has produced um, a random z yeah, so the, the outcome of this final measurement can be any z which is part in this of this uh, superposition with a non-zero amplitude um, so it's one of these z's with the property that the scalar product with the unknown s is zero and this does not yet give us the s that we are looking for the idea is then to repeat the circuit and each run of the circuit will produce generally another z uh, because um, the outcome of this final measurement on the data qubits it can be any of the z's um, which are represented in the superposition um, and it's a random one so um, in general each run it will be a different one now of course by accident you can have the same z but um, if you just if you run the circuit often enough you will obtain um, sufficiently many different z's which all have the property that their scalar product with s vanishes and you repeat the circuits so many times until you have collected enough z's so that you have n minus one independent conditions for the s yeah and then there is an nth condition for the s which simply comes from the fact that it must be a bit string where all the bits have can only have the value zero or one yeah? so that's an nth an additional condition yeah so you just repeat the circuit often enough until you have enough independent conditions on the s which determine the s uniquely and there are if you have um uh sort of n minus one independent conditions for s of the form scalar product with some z is equal to zero so you have a set of linear equations of independent linear equations plus the condition that all the digits must be zero or one then there exists uh, there exists efficient classical algorithms which um, determine the s for you yeah and um, so it's clearly a probabilistic algorithm yeah, it's not guaranteed that after um, a definite number of steps you always have the solution yeah, because you can never exclude that um, in various runs you get conditions which are not independent of each other yeah? so every time you might have to run the circuit a different number of times but what you can show is that on average the number of times you have to run the circuit until you have a sufficient number of independent conditions for the s so that you can determine the s this average number of runs scales linearly with the length of the bit string so linearly with n and this is an improvement obviously over the classical case where the number of function calls uh, grows exponentially with n and here even though in a probabilistic fashion um, the the average number of function calls grows only linearly with n that's the basic idea behind simon's algorithm <laughs>